Yes, hello everyone and welcome to all our West Australian football fans to another edition of Around the Waffle, the official podcast of the West Australian Football League. It is grand final week. Can you feel it in the air? Optus Stadium is ready to rock. The big dance is back on the big stage. It's East Fremantle taking on Peel Thunder this Sunday afternoon in the grand final. Will it be East Fremantle's first in 25 years or will Peel make it their third premiership in their short history? My name is Paul Persick. It's a great pleasure to have your company here at the Back Chat Studios and along Inside me is Mark Foreman. Forey, are you getting it? That grand final feeling. <laughs> Sunday afternoon, it's coming very soon. Uh, I certainly am, yeah. it's Grand final week's amazing uh, in, in any sport, really. But, uh, yeah, I'm feeling it, and it's, uh, it's exciting. We've had the captain's call, and the coaches have spoken, and there's always, you know, a bit of controversy and a bit of... Um, uh, a bit of mystery surrounding team selection, so... Grand final week's already had it all. But, Absolutely. Um, yeah, no, I'm pumped. I'm we'll re- get into more of that news heading into the game a little later on in the show here on Around the Waffle. We'll also have Jeff Valentine coming up in just a little bit, the Peel Thunder coach, to talk about Peel's preliminary final win over Subiaco. And then Billy Monaghan, the East Fremantle coach, is going to join us as well. And we'll have a, a third special guest for the last word as to who will win the big dance. This is Around the Waffle, the official podcast of the WAFL. Now, Peel Thunder, of course, they booked their spot in the grand final with a hard-fought win against Subiaco last Sunday in Mandra. And Jeff Valentine, their coach, he is the talk of the town heading into the big dance on Sunday, and he's good enough to join us on today's show. Hello, Jeff. How are you? Yeah, good. Good morning, man. Good morning, Jeff. Great to have you on the show. What's the confidence like for your side and yourself heading into Sunday's game? Yeah, look, like any other game, mate, we're, we're planning to win and um, yeah, really happy with the preparation. Um, you know, over the last sort of three or four weeks, the, the team's been able to come together really well. Um, I think there's been some, um, you know, real natural development in, in the group and um, positional things and those sorts of things. So, um, yeah, get through main training tomorrow and, um, yeah, just start to narrow the focus in on the Sunday. Uh, Jeff, Mark Foreman here. Come on, it's not like any other game. Uh, have you, uh, look, I, I know preparation stay the same, but have you, have spoken to some of your players about how to deal with grand final week, particularly the younger players. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, no, no, it's important you acknowledge that. And, and you're right. In some aspects, it, it is like any other game. You know, the process doesn't change, but in, in many other ways, it, it, it's not like any other game. It's the grand final, and you know, there's lots of distractions. There's ticketing. You know, there's transport. You know, all of the little things that have the potential to get you off task. I know we've had a a good chat about, um, you know, some of those distractions, how we can deal with those. And um, and at the end of the day, you know, it's, it's important that you do address those because you know, the players need to be really clear um, come Sunday sort of lunchtime about what their role is and, and where they fit into the team and, and what's required. So, um, yeah, no, we had a, a good day yesterday to, to sort of tie off the, the Subiaco sort of final and um, outline the week, talk about distractions, um, day off today. And, and like I say, tomorrow then becomes really about... Um, East Fremantle, you know, main training, um, and then sort of tapering off towards the back end of the week. Let's go back to that preliminary final on Sunday against Subiaco. It was a great start by your side. Five goals to two kicked in the opening term. But really, it was the, the back lines that really made a huge difference for Peel Thunder. Jacob Blight, in particular, he had a really good game, uh, shutting down the likes of Ben Sokol and Ryan Borshett. Was that the main target from the outset? Because the likes of Sokol and Borshett could really tear up a game up forward. Oh, yeah, yeah. Look, it was a, a key part of it, yeah. You've got to respect, um, you know, their forward um, power uh, up there. But no, it was it was right, right across the, the the line. You know, clearly in any final you want to get off to a good start. I, I thought our midfield uh, mix was, was was much better. We were able to sort of get it into our front half, and the, the forwards took advantage of that. A couple of nice conversions from set shots. But yeah, look, particularly pleased the way the backs went. You know, we sort of took Wagner out of out of the back line into the midfield, and um, it, it look it probably looked a, a better balance um, down there. The, the four talls or the four sort of intercept markers um, were really able to go to work and, and that was on the back of the, the pressure up the ground and every time um, sort of Subiaco had to kick over hands and there was some pressure on, the, on their kicks coming in like you say Blighty Joel Hamling you know Huey Davies had his best ground you know Carl Warner stood in the hole many times so um, yeah their aerial work was uh, was really good Selwood um, sort of falls into that mix as well and then Anderson and um, Nate Wilson really gave us some sort of bounce out of there. So, um, yeah, the backs were, were super on the weekend. Well, Jeff, let's have a look uh, towards this weekend. Obviously, uh, you know, uh, just a massive game for the club. Uh, well, I want to quickly ask, any uh, any selection news that you can give us some insight to? <laughs> yeah, we'll, we'll, yeah, we'll be the same, same 22. Okay. 
as, as, yep, same 22. Yeah, so, everyone seems to have sort of pulled up well. And, yeah, assuming everyone gets through um, yeah, training tomorrow night and, and Saturday morning, it will, will be the same 22 again. Oh, fantastic, Jeff. That helps those of us calling the game uh, so we can uh, make sure we lock them yep. down. Hey, look, we, you obviously know your team inside out. Tell us about East Fremantle. What what, uh, what do they bring? What, what are their greatest threats? And how do you nullify them? Yeah, well, look, it's... It's um, you know they're a well balanced team you know right across the the, the park you know their their midfield mix um, you know is as good as anyone sort of going around you, you know you look at their ruck combination with sort of Dixon and, and Ruben Maguire two very different rucks um, you know the way they go about it obviously Dixon can go forward so you know we need to make sure we're on top of that um, you know Harry Marsh is for me probably the most influential midfielder in, in the back half of the season his ability to um, you know, get forward and have inside 50s um, is, is elite in the competition. Um, so he's, he's always a big watch. Milan Murdoch um, came into the team um, in, the, in the first final. And, it's you know, I've seen a lot of Milan sort of play through the years. When I was back at Guildford Grammar, he was um, the Christchurch. And, um, you know, he was still the same feisty little little fella uh, back in those days as a 17-year-old. So, it's um, you know, it's great to see that he's been able to sort of transfer um, that sort of footy through to senior footy. Um, so they're... they're Sort of through their midfield, but again, it, it bats pretty deep. You know, Joyce, their wingers, Bennett, um, so that, that sort of stuff. And then they got the bounce off half back. Um, you know, Cam Erdley you know, had a big game against us last week, had 30 touches, and you know, I, I was fortunate to coach the state team a couple of years ago. And um, and Cam was in the team, and I thought he probably should have won the Simpson Medal that day off half back. So you know, I don't know exactly what he could do. Baskerville's in that that same mould. Um, you know, Juppie's ability to, to sort of control the air and organise his backs is, is immense. Um, and, and then up forward, they've got some um, some goal kicking power up there. You know, um, so obviously some speculation about John O'Marsh, but we'll we'll plan to have him in there. Like I said, Huey Dixon, um, Monty Ben adds some pace. So yeah, look, it's just a, a really well balanced team um, across the board. So um, I don't think there's any one specific area where we need to target. It's, it's a case of well, they've got us the last two times. We're going to need to be better. Jeff, it's a big game for your side. Go out there and get them on Sunday. Thanks for your time, Jeff Valentine, here on Around the Waffle. Yeah, pleasure, man. Go well. That was Jeff Valentine, the coach of Peel Thunder. So they were going in unchanged for Sunday afternoon's grand final. That is some good news for Thunder fans, no doubt about that. Yeah, it is. A bit of consistency, um, you know, in finals, oh, heading into a grand final as well. And uh, it's got to be said, uh, appreciated the transparency for, for him to tell us that. That's, um, you know, perhaps not something we're always used to in media in a grand final week, but that is fantastic news for Peel and uh, also uh, fantastic news for Jeff Valentine who ha- doesn't have to have one of those heartbreaking conversations Absolutely. about, you know, whether whether it's through, um, you know, someone being dropped or through an injury or something like that. You know, that must just be the most harrowing conversation to i imagine receive but also to deliver so yeah, it's those selection headaches that you yeah. don't want to have on grand final week but uh, to jeff's relief he's not having any of those going in no. unchanged for sunday <laughs> afternoon billy monaghan the east Fremantle coach is going to join us a little later on will it be the same news or will there be an out as far as jonathan marsh is concerned because he's had a little bit of doubt over his hamstring over the last couple of days he'll talk to us about that a little later on this is around the waffle the official podcast of the wafl now, we'll look back on this uh, preliminary final for a Peel Thunder just too strong, 11-11 to 7-11 over Subiaco in Mandra. And again, it was set up by that first quarter start. I mean, when you look mm. at it with the breeze, five goals three to two goals straight. Peel, they basically wrapped up the game at quarter time and Subi were just playing catch up. Yeah, they were. I think they were out to four goals to nil at one point or, right. or, or at least, you know, a, a margin of four goals. And um, you're right, that's, that's where... Yeah, I, I think we've spoken about this probably after week one of finals, I remember. If you give up big leads in finals, like I know, you know, it happens during the home and away season, but in finals, it's just that it's such a different game. And um, that's exactly what they did. They gave up a lead and to try and claw back is just so difficult because even if you do get a little run on, it doesn't usually last for that long in a final. Right. And, and sure enough, I mean, Subi, you know, did their best to try and give it a shake, but... 
just couldn't get there. And, um, you know, that's credit to Peel. They, they played really well. They certainly did. They played a great brand of football. They used the ground to their advantage. Uh, and you also have the likes of Hamling and Jacob Blight, as uh, Jeff Allentine mentioned, being those backline pillars to shut down Ben Sokol and uh, Ryan Borchett on that Subiaco forward line. In fact, eight, uh, 18 marks between them. Yeah. And you also add in Michael Selwood to that equation, nine marks as well. So the, so that three key Peel backline, that three-string backline, took 27 marks between <laughs> them in that preliminary final competition. Completely shut out Sokol and bore shared out of the game. That's incredible. 27 marks and they uh, certainly shared it around as well. And I, I did notice, I was watching this game back in, in preparation for, for this weekend and um, Carl Warner worked really yeah. hard behind the ball. He um, was. He was solid. 10 marks he, as well. Yeah. And I, I didn't realize the height that he sort of had. You know, I've obviously seen him play before, but... Um, he, he made himself real tall and um, he, he was also a pillar as well as those three that you mentioned. So uh, they're going to need them all firing because we know the, the threat that East Fremantle brings, but um, they, they were, they were really good. With those three, including, of course, uh, Michael Selwood, Carl Warner, Joel Hamling and Jacob Blight be the key to shutting down a forward line for East Fremantle. That could be a revolving door, especially with the news about John O'Marsh's doubts and the possibility of Dylan O'Reilly coming back into the side for Sunday. Do those three or four have the biggest responsibility of the game? Um, I don't think you, I mean, personally, and I've, I think reflected what Jeff Valentine said, I don't think you put it on a handful of players. They sort of work as a bit of a team defense, which is sort of how they get all those marks because they look after each other and, um, you know, they work with each other. So, um, you know, are they the key? I don't think so, but they are a key. Absolutely. Yeah. And, um, and you know, shutting down East Fremantle's forward line is going to be critical. So they'll be a big part of that. But uh, I, what I was impressed by was the way that they worked as a unit, you the know, rather, unit, yeah, yeah. rather than individually. And it was, um, it was really impressive to watch. Yeah, definitely. And Peel, you know, coming into form at just the right time, coming from that uh, qualifying final win, then bouncing back from that second semi-final loss the week mm. before, they were able to get it all together as a collective unit. They were simply sensational. And another fact to take us out from that, from this preliminary final, it's the first time in 23 years that a grand final will not feature Subiaco, West Perth, Claremont or South Fremantle either one or both in a grand final so it's sort of a fresh feel to the grand final on Sunday I saw that yeah it is and um, you know we've got the the history of, of East Fremantle to 25 years and um, you know people who well I suppose since their inception have been a little up and down but um, you know they'll be a reasonably popular winner if they did get there and um, it sort of it's a bit of GWS feel about them. They've got a sort bit of a of, yeah. bit of a backing behind them, and um, do. you know they're they're developing that momentum. But um, it is. I, I'm really excited. I, you know, two teams who um, aren't as totally familiar in grand finals as we've perhaps been used to as um, WAFL followers. We'll preview more of that a little bit later on here on Around the Waffle. Just a reminder, the grand final can be seen live, free and in full on the AFL app as well as Channel 7 from 3.20. It's going to be an absolute belter on Sunday afternoon. Just before we go to Billy Monaghan, the East Fremantle coach, just a quick uh, scoop on the Colts and Reserves preliminary finals. West Perth in the Reserves, they got the job done against Subiaco uh, by 37 points. They'll play Swan Districts on Sunday morning and and then Perth, they bounced back at the right time. They defeated East Fremantle in that Colts preliminary final. So it'll be Perth and Claremont in the Colts grand final at 12.10. This is Around the Waffle, the official podcast of the WAFL. East Fremantle, they're looking for their first flag in 25 years. 1998, yes. their last flag. It's a long time between drinks. And the man that could lead his side to their first flag in that long time is their coach, Billy Monaghan. And he's good enough to join us on Around the Waffle. G'day, Billy. Yeah, good morning, gentlemen. How are we today? Going well. Absolutely pumped for the grand final. I bet you are as well. First one as East Fremantle coach. What's the morale like within the group uh, ahead of the big one on Sunday? Yeah, look, we're all pretty excited. Um, the playing group worked really hard over a long period of time and, and they thoroughly deserve their chance to have a shot at winning their grand final. And, and then there's you know long-suffering East Fremantle supporters, board members, staff and so on who, who have been waiting a while for this opportunity. So it's going to be an exciting day for us. Hi, Bill. Mark Foreman here. And you've probably got this answer scripted because you'll answer it 100 times this week. But can you tell us about John O'Marsh? Where, where's he at and what's happening? Yeah, look, John O's had some scans and, um, you know, he's probably a genuine 50-50 chance at this stage. Um the, the doctor and the medical team have given him the green light to 
to ramp up some training today. Okay. Um, he'll do some running today. Um, if he pulls up well from that, he'll join in and do our training session on Friday. And then obviously if he pulls up well from that, um, we'll make a decision on Saturday morning. Um, like most players, he's pretty keen to, yeah, to have a yeah. have the opportunity to play. He's really important to us. He, you know, he's, he's an exceptionally good player and, um, you know, it'd be remiss of us not to give him the opportunity to try. Um, but, to be completely honest, until he until he runs today, mm. um, that'll be the first the first thing we need to check off, and that won't be till this afternoon. So, still a little bit to play out there, and a little bit up in the air. Can I try and sneak this one in, uh, Bill? You said it wasn't a hamstring. Can you tell us what it might be? Yeah, it's ser- it is definitely still not a hamstring. <laughs> um, it is it is a leg problem, and oh, look, I. I I don't think it really matters no, whether yeah. I tell you or not, but it's a it's a little bit of fun to <laughs> because someone reported it was a hamstring. So right. um, try, trying to let Peel um, work it out themselves <laughs> and find out where he's training today. So we're training at um, Coburn, which is the home of yeah. um, Fremantle Rockers, obviously. So he'll actually train away from there. Um, okay. If they want to run their eye over him, they'll have to find out what time he's doing and where he is at always a little bit of cloak and dagger and intrigue so we're just playing a bit of a game really at the moment so don't want to give too much information away Let, let's call it a pinky toe <laughs> yeah, it could well be turf toe that's, uh, that's the first time someone's had a crack at it so um <laughs> It could be turf time. Now, if John O'Marsh doesn't pull up well and is unavailable, who's going to be uh, brought back into the side? Uh, well, we're going to make at least one change anyway with Jared Jansen, um, who was unavailable in the second semi final. So he'll come back in. And the beauty of Jared is that he can play multiple roles. Um, you know, he, he started the season down back. He's an exceptionally um, good midfielder and he, he's won a Lynn medal, our fairest and best count in in the short and COVID year, predominantly playing at ten and a half forward. So um, we're, we're extremely lucky to have Jared to come back in, and and then if John is available, we'll we'll work through the other selection processes after that. What about Milan Murdoch? Uh, he was a huge key in that second semi final a couple of weeks ago, coming back from a long injury spell and a couple of games in reserves. How important is he to the side? Oh, look, he he's fantastic. He's he's a wonderful player to coach. He gives you all. There's not much of him. Um, you know, he hunts the ball, he, he tackles, he chases. Um, so, look, he was really important. I think he ended up with 30-odd possessions. So, you know, against the Peel midfield that he's stacked with some talent, um, it's good to have him in the midfield as well. Bill, not your first grand final as a coach. Um, have you ever, I mean, it sounds like you, you've got some hard conversations to have this week. How do you go about telling players that they may not play in a grand final? Yeah, look, it's it's one of the downsides of the job. I, I guess mm. there's an upside to it when the bigger the games get, and and in particular in grand finals, that you know you've made it all the way to the the, the big show. So that's always the positive out of it. The negative is you, you're shattering people's dreams and yeah. and their their hard work. So it it is it is literally the worst part of the job. It's hard enough dropping people on a weekly basis for a home and away game. Um, the bigger the game, the you know, the bigger the disappointment, and you now it's not something that sits well with any coach, I'm sure, and it definitely doesn't sit well with me. Now, what about uh, Fraser Turner as well? We've been very impressed uh, with him this season, coming over from South Adelaide in the Sandfall. He's really progressed his game as a key midfielder. Yeah, look, he's an exceptionally good runner. Um, it probably took him a little while to adjust to one our playing style. Um, our big grounds here really suit him, so Optus will be fantastic um, for him. You know, his mates with Luke English, and that they both played in the 2019 um, Richmond BFL Premiership. So, you know, we're lucky enough to have some experience with those two guys and, and with Harry Marsh and, and Braden Law who played premierships at other teams as well. So, you know, that, that holds us in good stead um, going into a big game. Last one from me, Bill. Um, tell us, what, what would this mean to, to you and, and to the club to win a flag here? Oh, look, I think uh, you know, it's pretty well documented that East Romana were at a pretty low ebb when I took over. Um, and credit to the players that have stuck through it and, and the players that you know we identified as, as the future and then the players that we've brought in. You know, they, 
they've really worked hard for this opportunity. Um, we thought at stages last year that, you know, last year might have been a, an opportunity to get all the way to the grand final. It wasn't to be, and they've come back and worked, worked extremely hard this year. So, um, you know, ultimately it's about the players and that they're the number one show and then, you know, coaches and support staff and members and, and staff in general at the football club. You know, we'll all be really proud if the, the players are able to pull it off and, you know, we're really proud of our players anyway. Billy, it's a huge day for you and the players. Go out there and get them on Sunday. Thanks for your time, Bill. Good luck. No worries. Thanks, guys, for having me. Thanks, Bill. Billy Monaghan from East Fremantle, the man that could lead the Sharks to their first flag in 25 years. All right, now before we get to our preview of the grand final, we want to get the last word from someone who may not be involved in the game, but... He's got a very good perspective on Sunday afternoon. He is the Sandover medalist, and he's a very big part of the Back Chat family here in Western Australia. He is East Perth's Hamish Brayshaw. Hammer, what have you got for us? Boy, uh, yeah, it's, uh, I mean, I obviously would love to be playing in the uh, on the weekend, but, um, geez, it's looking like it's going to be a pretty good game, isn't it? I'm excited. Uh, I'll be away in Sydney with the uh, with our AFW team at West Coast, but I will be uh, getting a very close eye on it, and I'm very, very interested to see the outcome. Who holds the key for uh, for both sides in the big dance? Yeah, it's uh, it's interesting. I, I think looking at um, looking at the way that they've gone, I think the last time they played each other, the back line of East Frio um, held up really, really well, and, and obviously Matthew Jupp is a key part of that, and his, the leadership that he has down there. I imagine Peel are going to play a similar style of football than they have in the last month or so, which is free flowing and getting an inside fifty. So I think for them, it's um, <clears throat> Matthew Jupp is. Is the key if he can hold that with Cam Erdley down back that they'll uh, they'll be they'll be set up really well to counteract from that and 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 go really close to winning the game and and I think for Peel it's uh, I, I had the question mark on them at the start of the final series whether or not their AFL listed guys would buy in and um and that question's been very well put to bed so I think for them they've got the Peel experience in guys like Blair Bell and Ben Hancock but if they can get the buy in which they have done from these um, AFL listed guys who seem to be running all over the ground and, and, and making it a real contest for the last hour. And I think it's going to be, uh, yeah, I think it'll be a really, really fascinating game. So I think Matthew Jupp's a big one for Freo, uh, sorry, for East Freo, if he can get them going. And then for Peel, I think it's the uh, the weight of those listed players. If they can really step up and, and get going, then it's um, it's going to be a hard one for East Freo. Hammer, it's Mark here. Um, I know that this you can answer this question without providing any disrespect to the team you don't choose. Who's midfield? Did you find hardest to face up against out of Peel and East Fremantle? Yeah, it's it's, it's tough. I mean, <laughs> for us, for us, I think when we played uh, East Freo, we played them at the Wacker, and yeah. and they had ruck dominance. Jed went down, and, and Scott Jones obviously wasn't playing, so they were able to dictate some things to us in there. And um, Harry Marsh played a really good game, and, and they had some really good depth through there that got us that got us going. And um, with Milan Murdoch back in the side, he's He's always tough to play on. Uh, he's almost, I think he's probably my least favourite player to play on in the whole comp. So, yeah. um, and then but, but Peel, are, Peel are just a stack through there as well. So mm. I think with the uh, with the ruck dominance that Peel are likely to have, that'll be a, a big win. But I think in terms of the hunt and aggression around the footy, uh, East Freo, uh, uh, their midfield is a hungry one that's, uh, that's pretty tough to match up on. So okay. I think both of them have their respective... Qualities, but uh, I would say East Freo is the hardest one for, for us to match up on anyway. All right, Hammer, I'm going to put you on the hottest of hot seats now. It's at 7,800 degrees Fahrenheit. Who wins and who takes out the Simpson medal? Oh, I think Peel win. I just think that um, they're, they're playing such good football and they're in a position where they've got retiring AFL players that want to play really well and win a flag and go out on top. And I think the listed guys are just as hungry to, um, to make something of it. I think they get it done. I think... Uh, well, I want to say Blair Bell. I think Blair Bell goes out and kicks a couple and, and has a big impact around the footy. So I think Peel will win and I think Blair Bell will win the Simpson. I think I'm with you there, Hammer. Um, before we let you go, uh, we're over a week on from your fantastic win in the Sandover medal. Congratulations, by the way. How's the hangover? Oh, thank you very much. The hangover is actually not that bad. I, uh, <laughs> Monday, night was, Monday night into Tuesday morning was very good fun. Uh, and I had the day off from work on Tuesday, which worked well for me. But apart from that, I've uh, I've just been back into normal daily life. I've got oh. some things that I've had. To, I've had some things that I've had to do media wise, and that's uh, that's been a bit of fun. But yeah, the, hang- the hangover. <laughs> well, I wish it wasn't there, and I wish I was still playing. But um, no, it's, it's a whole lot easier to deal with with the sandover around my neck. Oh, uh, media Street was calling very quickly. Uh, thanks, Hammer. Thanks uh, for your time, and uh, all the best for the rest of the year. No worries, guys. Thank you very much.
That Thanks, was Hammer Brayshaw with his last word on the big dance this Sunday. This is Around the Waffle, the official podcast of the WAFL. Here we go, Forey. This is it. Sunday. Can you feel the excitement in the air? And we bet everyone around West Australia can feel it as well. The grand final. East from Andal, Peel Thunder. 3.20 on Sunday on Channel 7. And I reckon we may have a th- another thriller in prospect. Think about this. The three meetings they had la- uh, this year. Four points in round one, Peel. 19 points in Geraldton, round 14, east from Antle. The second semi final by five points, east from Antle. Can we see a fourth close game in a row? That's incredible. You know, that's, uh, it's, that's some tight, tight results. And look, that's all we hope for. As a neutral, uh, you know, I don't particularly have anybody that I'm, I'm cheering for, but as a neutral, that's all you want in, Absolutely. A, in a grand final. And, you know, they're the, they're the games that we remember for, you know, for years. I, I think back to, it must have been. Ooh, this is testing me. It must have been 2012-ish when um, Swan Districts won by a point. 2010. 10. Okay, there you go. Yes, actually, that was mine. Yep. Um, and it was uh, Andrew Cracker, you know, played oh. really well. And Cornelio, Cornelio you know, yes. before he went went over to GWS. So uh, that was a one-point game. And that's a, grand, a WAFL grand final that I'll sort of never forget. I remember watching it. And, um, you know, hopefully we get something similar. You know, I'm not saying, I'm not asking for a one-point game, but... If it, as long as it's tight, it's close, it's contested, um, it'll, it'll be a grand final that we will remember. And, and it's a fresh feel, like you said, you know, we're, we're not used to seeing East from Andal and Peel Thunder playing off in a grand final. In fact, it's their first ever meeting in a grand final, only their second in a final in recent history, going back to two weeks ago in the second semi final. But you also, you look at their side on paper, their depth is tremendous at all areas of the ground. You look at Peel's balance between the Frio and local plays, they've got it right. They're gelling so well. So too are East from Andal, who, of course, even though they have to make the one or two changes with Jared Jansen coming back in. Peel, by the way, going in unchanged for Sunday's mm. game. The gel that is there for East Fremantle. They have gone on so well. They're playing some great football. Their brand of football as well has been very, very spectacular. Same can be said for Peel Thunder. I reckon we're going to see a fast, straight shootout on uh, on Sunday. Yeah, and, you know, it's it's no surprise when we asked uh, Jeff Valentine, you know, oh, what is it about East Fremantle that you need to sort of look out for? And he ended up sort of, almost mentioning all, all 22 players on the field, and, and that is the depth that they have. So um, this is, you know, this game and almost any grand final is, is not won by talent. It's sort of won, I, I sort of feel grand finals are won mentally, um, who can hold their nerve, you know. It'll be a high-pressure game, so who can withstand the pressure and execute the skills under pressure and, and play and players playing their role um, and, and not straying from that in the, in the heat of what is a, a, a real pressure cooker. Yeah, it's not just one by talent or ability. It's got to be one by desire. You know, who yeah. has the more desire to go after the Premiership Cup? And it's either going to be one of those teams on uh, on Sunday. Looking at the keys for, for both sides, I reckon it's not just their midfield rotation that's going to be so crucial. It's going to be their back line. I mean, when you look at the likes of Hamling and Blight for Peel Thunder, those two key pillars, and from East Fremantle, Erdley and Jupp, experienced defenders who are going to have possibly one of the biggest targets tasks of their careers trying to shut down the likes of Middleton and Bell in that grand final that could be the battle that could go either way into deciding the game uh yeah it it, it will it, it, you know it's not the key it's a key um but you know I, I'm absolutely stoked for you know players like Matty Jupp so he is one who I you know I um having known his brother for for years I, I got to sort of see him play his footy at East Fremantle and they were struggling, you know, that they were, they were really battling. And, um, this is what Bill Monaghan told us just, just a short time ago that, um, they've stuck by some of these players and Matt Jupp's one of them. And he's mm. clearly a good leader and he's been there a long time and, um, you know, gets his chance. And, and that's what is really nice about this story is that he, he's not the only one, you know, no. is that, um, it's been a long time coming for East Romano to have an opportunity like this where they're genuine genuine contenders now absolutely um, and, and we look at their side on paper the way they've played at the right time it really reflects why East Fremantle like Peel Thunder deserve to be in that grand final yeah and and absolutely and, and it's not you know it's not just Matty Jupp so yeah that, that defensive post you talk about um, Cam Erdley off sort of half back or out of the back line is a key role as well so um, you know the way they organise will be really important um, interested to see that those selection calls and you know poor poor old Bill Monaghan sounds like he he's going to have uh, at least one perhaps two really tough conversations and 
regardless of what happens with um, John O'Marsh, it, it's still a tough conversation because I suspect he will say, yeah, I'm playing. Um, and he might need to be told, sorry, I just don't know if you, you're up for that. Spare so. a thought for Billy, you know, obviously with yeah. the, having to make those those tough calls, which is, <laughs> as he said, and it applies to any coach in a grand final. Yep. That is yep. obviously the biggest downside of uh, of the job. Now, I'm going to put you in the hot seat for you. 7,800 degrees Fahrenheit and it's Oy. getting warmer. <laughs> who wins and who takes out the Simpson medal for either side should either side win? Okay. Um, oh, it's like sitting on hot coals here, yes, Paul. Yes, it is. Um, I'll say... Look, I, I um I, I tend to think I'm leaning towards Peel. With by the way, absolutely no confidence. Like I can make cases for both teams, but I am leaning towards Peel. My reasoning is these eleven AFL listed players uh, just seem to be at the front of my mind now. Um, on top of that, it's the balance that they've struck with um local the the local amalgamation yeah. and being able to really unify the team. And that seems like what they've been able to do. So, um, with that in mind, I'll go. But I'll go peel. I'm going to say by under three goals. Um, and look, Will Brody probably for me. He's been playing there most of the year. I think he might have got one or two AFL games, but he, um, you know, he's been a, a real, you know, pillar for Peel Thunder's midfield. So if if they're to win, I think he, he'll be a big part. The other one I want to mention is um, Tom Emmett. I think, Emmett, yeah. I, I think he might be a, I like, I mean, you wouldn't say dark horse because he's obviously an AFL listed player, but he, he's not one that sort of has, you know, burst out and sort of torn games away. One of those unsung players, Week after really. week. Yeah. But what I saw when he, obviously I'm a close watcher of the AFL. What I saw in his debut was really something, I just saw something different about him, I think. And he, he's got that ability to take a game away from yeah, you. Not that he does. And he's only a young player. So not that he does it week in, week out, but well, have a look for him. You know, if he kicks a few goals, um, uh, might go a long way towards uh, Peel winning as well. But I will go with Brody if East Fremantle can win, which you can absolutely make a case for them. I'm going to say um, Milan Murdoch, who that's a good choice had a really strong first half of the year, sort of dipped a little bit, but um, uh, we know the quality he brings. And um, he, you heard Bill Monaghan. Uh, sorry, I think you heard Jeff Valentine say. You know, he's got that little edge of aggression too. He does. Um, he's got that fire in the belly. So uh, he'll be a really important player for East Fremantle. You've gone with Peel Thunder. I'm going the other way. I'm sticking with my <laughs> preseason tip. I'm going like with the uh, East Fremantle. I reckon it's going to be a point. I reckon it's going to be a point. In oh, it. I've got a reckon... gut feeling that it's going to be one point in it, and the crowd will go absolutely hysterical. East Fremantle for me. They'll break the 25 year drought. And before Sim- you give me your Simpson medal and. The- this is probably a completely throwaway question because you know why I'm asking it. What is the most common margin in AFL VFL history? Well, it's definitely a point. It is a point. It is a point. <laughs> I'm going to say go. by one point. So uh, there you go. Good, good call. Who are your Simpson medalists? Well, if East from out win, I'm going to say Fraser Turner, the South Australian. I mean, yep. what a great season he's having. He's adapted to the East from out style in yep. such a short time, and the, the quality that he's got and the business that he goes about it, the way he goes about mm. it, is sensational. He's able to find the ball anywhere, whether it be at the coal face or out out wide uh, anywhere yep. along centre wing, and he's got that ability to kick that odd goal to really bring his team together. So Fraser Turner, if East from out win. If Peel Thunder win, yep. I'm going to say Ben Hancock. I reckon okay. the grand final at times can be made for the captain. He could have yeah. a captain's game and really lead his side to victory. So for Peel Thunder, I'll say Ben Hancock if uh, the Thunder get the job done on Sunday. What a game it's going to be. I can feel the adrenaline already. <laughs> I can see it in your eyes, Paul. Oh, goodness. If uh, Well, yeah. I mean, it's, it's so exciting. Grand final week's amazing and... Um, I think people are going to start sharing the excitement that you've got right now as well because we're only, uh, well, we, the countdown is on. Certainly is. Forey, enjoy the big day on Sunday. I'll see you next week to review the big game and the season. And we'll look forward to it, Paul. Thank you. Thanks, Forey, and thank you to all our listeners and viewers for tuning in today. Just a reminder, Sunday, what a day it's going to be of WAFL Grand Final Football. The menu is this. First off, 9.20 in the morning. It's the Reserves Grand Final between Swan Districts and West Perth. That is live on streamer.com.au. I'll be on the call for that one. Check it out. And then the Colts on Channel 7. It is the fourth meeting of the year between Perth and Claremont. Will we see another cracker to see who takes out the Colts Premiership? And then the big one, the main event at 3.20 at Optus Stadium. It is East Fremantle looking for their first flag in 25 years, taking on Peel Thunder, aiming for their third Premiership in their short WAFL history. We hope to see you there at Optus Stadium, and we look forward to your company next Wednesday to review the game and the season that was 2023 on Around the Waffle, the official podcast of the West Australian Football League. We'll see you next time. Thank you.